Well, church, uh, we're excited to see what God is going to be doing, uh, trusting that, that you are uh, ready for a, sort of a new chapter in a lot of different ways. And I'm going to ask you to bear with me with my little scratchy voice today. I'm not auditioning for a Kathleen Turner film. Um, just have a little bit of a cold that left me a little, you know, smoky and whatever. Uh, so I did bring my favorite drink along with me, as, as you know. I like my Chamomile tea. You didn't get it last time either, but it's good. Yeah, you got it. It just wasn't funny. <laughs> Very good. So over the last couple of weeks, we've been talking about several aspects of this crazy little thing called the church. What is God's plan for this strange, beautiful, imperfect, incredible thing called the church? And uh, as a part of the church, if you're in Christ today, realizing that you have gifts to share, that you have a mission to fulfill, that you can be a part of the commission that God has given to this thing that's called his beautiful bride, I want to challenge you to think just a little bit about what is my place in the body of Christ? What is it that God has uniquely called you to do to fulfill his great commission? What is your personal ministry or mission? I want to read a quote from Paul David Tripp. He said, personal ministry is not about always knowing what to say. It is not about fixing everything in sight that is broken. Personal ministry is about connecting people with Christ so that they are able to think as he would have them think, desire what he says is best, and to do what he calls them to do, even if their circumstances never get fixed. It involves exposing hurt, lost, and confused people to God's glory so that they give up their pursuit of their own glory and live for his. That's a part of what ministry is all about. Last week, just as a little bit of review, we said, asked the question, so what is the church? If it's truly a living organism built on the cornerstone of Christ, then all of the aspects of the church find their support and life and energy in direct connection to Jesus Christ, who he is himself. So the church, we said, is the body of believers who acknowledge and promote the supremacy of Christ. If you want to put up that uh, slide on the, uh, with, the, uh, with the various words, supremacy of Christ, they have the new life in Christ. Together with each one playing his or her part, they form the body of Christ, pursue the glory of Christ, and they go to incredible lengths to fulfill the mission of Christ. And that's where we sort of left off last week, and I want to pick up on that idea of the mission of Christ today. This is the church. This is what we're called to. Now, I was thinking a little bit about a trip. Amy and I took the boys down uh, last fall. We just had a little vacation time, and uh, we went down to the Asheville, North Carolina area. Some of you maybe have been through that area. Very beautiful, very mountainous, and lots of little towns and things like that. And as we were traveling, one of the things that I noticed was that there were a lot of these just little country churches kind of dotted all over the place. And Amy and I had a few little conversations about, you know, maybe one day God would call us to, to go pastor a little church like that sometime and, and have a little different experience than what we've had uh, in our current ministry experience. That's down the road sometime. We don't have any plans. We were just talking. But I noticed, especially in light of the fact that last week we were talking about sort of interesting church signs, I stopped at this one church right here that was in like Catawba Falls or something like that because the sign out front was really intriguing to me. Let's go ahead to the next slide. Here's the slide out front. Uh, Catawba Falls, Baptist Church. <laughs> Visitors welcome, members expected in bright red letters. And I thought to myself, boy, isn't that kind of an interesting thing? So I just want you just to, to file that for a second, you know, because I'd be interested to kind of unpack what is it in terms of our mentality that would allow us or, or cause a certain sign like that. And I wonder if this morning, as we get started thinking about this, if I asked you to think about how do you describe the church what is the metaphor that comes to mind? What is the simile that you use? When you say, you know, I think of the church like, how would you fill in the blank? In fact, I'd like you just as an exercise, just to take a second right now and think about that. I think of the church like this. What word would you use to fill in the blank? If you're taking notes, just jot your word down or whatever. If you're taking mental notes, you can just kind of get your word there. But I think of the church like this. 
And as we look at various scriptures and various experiences, cultural experiences and whatnot, we may come up with a variety of different answers. There may be those who would say, I think of the church sort of like a hospital. Did anybody have that as sort of their metaphor? I think of the church sort of like a hospital. And there's some, I think that there's some biblical aspects of that. Jesus said, I didn't come for the healthy, I came for the sick. I came to minister to those who are lost. But for many of us to think of the church like a hospital, or maybe at points in your life when you did, you thought of it as something that you were glad that it was there, right? Because if it was ever so desperate that I really needed something, I would show up. And that's how I think of the hospital. I don't want to hang out there all the time. I don't want to participate in what they're doing all the time. But if I really need them, I'm probably going to show up and talk to a doctor. Some of us might describe the church like a team, you know, if you're good enough, you get to play. We uh, just recently took the boys to the Penn State-Iowa basketball game. Boy, that was an exciting game. They came back over time. They didn't win. It was, would have been better if they had won. Uh, but we think of it like a team. If you're good enough, you get to play. And I think a lot of times when you think about the church that way, it does describe a lot of what we see, especially in the American church, that there's sort of an idea of like spectatorship. I don't think that's biblical. Uh, but I think it's sort of what we've maybe defaulted to in some different ways. And so we should think about that. Some of us think of it that way. Uh, some of us might say, well, the church is kind of like the army. You know, I mean, the song we used to sing when we were, I may never march in the infantry, shoot the artillery, ride in the cavalry. Do you remember that? But I'm in the Lord's army. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. We sang that in vacation Bible school. And that's not a bad metaphor either when we think about the spiritual battles that we're called to fight. In fact, I would suggest that maybe a church that puts out a sign that says, everyone welcome, members expected, might be thinking from kind of an army context. You know, if you join the, the armed services, you don't show up when you want to. You show up when you're told to. I'm in the Lord's army. Some of us think maybe the church like a club you can be here. Just make sure you pay your dues. Some of us may think of the church like a family. It's maybe the one place that I can find unconditional love. It's not bad. <clears throat> the Bible describes the church as the body of Christ, with each part doing its work, with Christ as the head. And I love that metaphor because it describes something that is living, that is moving, that is active, that is breathing, that is growing, that is changing. Even, as we talked about today, it's reproducing. New little churches being raised up. It's pretty exciting. So how you describe the church matters. How you think of the church matters. And it would be good for us to say, okay, God, help us to understand how it is that we should think about the church so that when we talk about the church being unleashed, we know what we are, in fact, unleashing. The church is a body of believers who acknowledge and promote the supremacy of Christ. They are alive because they have new life in Christ. Together, each one playing his part, they form the body of Christ, pursue the glory of Christ, and go to incredible lengths to fulfill the mission of Christ. Now, our mission is not a big secret. You know Matthew 28, 19 to 20. It tells us this. It says, therefore, go and make disciples of all nations, baptize them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, and teach them to obey everything I have commanded you. And surely, Jesus says, I am with you to the very end of the age. The interesting thing about our mission is that Jesus does not give us the specific strategies. Jesus does not give us the model of what, what specifically that could look like. In fact, it almost seems as we look at it scripturally that he gives us a lot of freedom so that as our culture, one culture to, to the next, we're not called to simply just look like one another. We're called to grow up in Christ. And I'm going to talk about in a few minutes uh, in, in New Living this idea that we have this freedom of cultural expression. You see that even here in our church family. That if you are more comfortable in a cultural or a worship expression like we are experiencing today, where we sing songs like Beulah Land from 100 years ago, that's wonderful. And Jesus says, that's great. Give me praise in that way. And if somebody else has a different cultural expression of how they bring praise to God, Jesus says, that's great. Bring me praise in that way. So I want to look at three things as we think about the mission of Christ today. And I'm going to look, we're going to, as we did sort of last week, this is not really our typical format, but we're going to kind of cover broader strokes in Ephesians 4, 5, and 6 as we look at these three points. So in Ephesians 4, if you want to flip over to uh, verse uh, 17 and following, 
I want to talk about new thinking. Uh, we're going to talk about new thinking, new living, and new challenges as, as uh, we consider the church. So new thinking, Ephesians chapter 4. <clears throat> Paul writes this, so I tell you this and insist on it in the Lord. That's some strong language. I tell you this and I insist on it in the Lord that you must no longer live as the Gentiles do in the futility of their, what's it say? Thinking. It goes on to say they're darkened in their understanding. They're separated from the life of God because of the ignorance that is in them due to the hardening of their hearts. And then it goes even a step farther to say that having lost this sensitivity, they've given themselves over to all kinds of sensuality. They've become very greedy so that when we don't think in the right way, it has an impact on the way that we live. And we're going to get there in just a minute. But he says, I want you to think differently. So I want you, church, to think in a different way. In fact, I insist on it in the Lord. I want you to kind of adjust your thinking. And I think this is powerful. It's in the area of new thinking that we begin to uncover the lies that the enemy wants us to believe about ourselves and our identity. It's in the arena of new thinking that we begin to find the truth that God desires to impart about our thinking. I was, think, I was reflecting on a student uh, that I, I met my very first year when we were with the campus ministry at ACF. His name was Mike. And uh, Mike was a neat student. He was a neat guy. I liked him from our very first conversation, although it was in that very first conversation that I thought, this is a young man who's sort of confused about himself and his direction in life. But I liked him. He had passion. He had some grit. You know, he, had, he wanted to live life to the fullest. He just wasn't sure what that meant. As I got to know him over the years, I began to, to find that Mike came from an incredibly, incredibly broken background. The, the, the situation that he grew up in, his family situation, having a, a dad who was pretty much absent, having stepdads who were, uh, <clears throat> who were uh, abusive, uh, even to him and, and certainly to his mother. Uh, watching kind of all of this brokenness unfold. And so he grew up kind of with a mentality that if, if I don't care for myself... If I don't even take advantage of other people so as to take care of myself, someone's going to take advantage of me, okay? So that was his truth. That was what he grew up in. So he said it wasn't uncommon for me if I could take advantage of somebody. If I could take their money, I'd take their money. If I could get kind of ahead by cheating somebody else, I would do that. Uh, it, it was always kind of this survival mode of look out for me. Well, God began to reveal to him. He gave his heart to the Lord that first year. He got saved. And as God began to sort of unpack things in his heart and in his life, he started to learn truth of God's word about forgiveness. I remember when he came to me and he said, I don't know how to forgive my stepdad. I don't know how to do that. And yet I feel very strongly that God is saying, this is a part of your growth. And so God began to, un to, to reveal to him. What are the lies that you've held on to? What are the things that you have, you have done? And so this heart work that God can do, this all is a product of this area of new thinking, and it leads to a different kind of living. Uh, it was amazing to see the transforming work of the gospel in this young man who came at this kind of broken place, from this broken place to an area now where he's married, he's raising children, he's serving in his church. He just actually helped start a few years ago a counseling program at their church, which has now grown to the point that their church is about 1,000 people. Uh, incredible ministry that God is doing through this person. And it all started with an adjustment in his thinking. <clears throat> so Ephesians 4 I tell you this, I insist on it in the Lord. You must no longer live as the Gentiles do in the futility of their thinking. If, if we as the church, just think about this for a minute. If we as, as the church don't think differently than our world, what do we have to offer? What do we have to offer? I got a, a comment from a, a young adult here in this church that was just such, a, such an interesting observation to me. Uh, it was about last week's sermon, and I was talking about this idea, you know, we tend to be a very me-first kind of uh, mentality in our culture. And this young lady wrote to me at some, some really interesting sort of feedback, and she, this is one of the things, I just want to share with you what she wrote. She said, I think it's helpful to note that the narcissism in our generation often expresses itself in self-loathing. 
and depression. Not necessarily in the form of rampant self-interest and me, me, me. Our concept of worth as individuals in our current cultural environment swings rapidly between the two without much of a middle ground. In this way, I think teaching a biblical view of personhood and worth is helpful. And in many ways, I think this is something State College Alliance does a good job of. We're not as important as we may think we are, but we still really matter to God. You know, here's a young person, a young woman, who's able to exegete her culture to be able to look at her generation and see what's going on. So when we say, you know, new thinking will allow for a different opportunity, the church has to offer something different than the world, or else we're just simply like the world that we're called to reach. So the area of new thinking, we unpack the lies that the enemy wants us to believe. We understand the truth of God's desire. We begin to see the transforming power of the gospel. And that's what we're talking about in these examples. Romans 12, 2, be transformed by the what? By the renewing of your mind. So there's a scriptural call again and again. If the church is to be unleashed, we've got to think differently. We've got to think scripturally. We've got to think with the new nature and not simply with the old. Ephesians 5 then leads us to new living. Look what Paul writes here in verse 8. <clears throat> For you were once in darkness, but you are now, uh, but you, uh, sorry, but now you are light in the Lord. You see what he says there? You were once in darkness, but now you are light in the Lord. So live as children of light. For the fruit of the light, it consists in all goodness, righteousness, and truth, and find out what pleases the Lord. I love that. I wonder how many of us, when's the last time we sat down and we said, okay, you know, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to really take inventory of this. I'm going to say, Lord, how do I live as a child of the light? How do I find out what pleases you? God, what is it that you would have of me? How, you see, in all of these things, we're taking sort of this secondary role We're saying, God, I want to honor you above my own pursuits. I want to honor you above. And all it really takes, again, adjustment in our thinking, but that leads to an adjustment in our living. We say, I'm going to find out what is it that pleases the Lord. How would that change your marriage today if you're married? How would that change your relationships? How would that change your relationship with your parents? How would that change your relationship with your friends? How would that change your relationship to your neighbors if we actually put this into practice to say, God, what is it that would please you. You know, the beautiful thing about the church, it's not that we're so special. We know our brokenness. You know, we know our our need for a Savior, but we've been empowered to think differently. We've been empowered to live differently and to say, God, what is it that would bring you pleasure today? Paul goes on to write in the same chapter. He says, this is why it is said, wake up, sleeper, rise from the dead, and Christ will shine on you. That's the theme verse for awake. As, I'm, as I understand it. Wake up, sleeper, rise from the dead, and Christ will shine on you. Be very careful then how you live, not as unwise but as wise, making the most of every opportunity because the days are evil. Don't be foolish, but understand what the Lord's will is. And then he unpacks this, this super important aspect. He says, don't get drunk on wine, don't be under control that way, but be under the control of the Holy Spirit. You realize that if you do not have the Holy Spirit working in your heart and life, there is no living differently. There is no deeper life. All of these things that the world so desperately needs and we so desperately need if we're going to show it to them. So the area of new living is where we find disciplines that lead us to new levels of intimacy with Christ. We find deeper life, which is being led by the Holy Spirit We find that in living for Jesus, you may not get, you know, there's all kinds of TV preachers that'll tell you, you live for Jesus and you're going to get rich and you're going to get all your health needs taken care of or whatever. You live for Jesus, you get Jesus. And the humble servant of Christ says, that is more than enough for me. And every time someone gets Jesus, the church grows a little bit. The body of Christ expands a little bit. So we've got to think differently. We're called to live differently. Um, <clears throat> I'll just touch on this for a minute because it's not the main point of the message, but it might be worth stating. There was sort of a, 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 one of the black eyes in the history of the church is what we would call colonialism. 
you know, this idea that, you know, the European church is going to go around the world and, and make little sort of cultural re, uh, 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 what's the word I'm looking for, uh, make copies of itself uh, over and over again. And so that's when you see these, these sort of odd pictures of, you know, a tribe in Africa that has been colonialized, has been sort of taken the, the white European influence, and now everybody's wearing shirt and ties and everything like that. I don't think that's what it's about. In fact, the beauty of the gospel is that in every culture in the world, the expression of the gospel is received and then culturally expressed in that way. So that's why you can have a primarily white church in uh, upper middle class America that meets together and worships in a certain way with Jesus Christ as the head with the body of Christ gathered together in each part doing its work. And you can have a church in a tribal colony in Africa that worships in a very different sort of style. It's also interesting that the seat of Christianity is no longer where it started. It has literally gone all over the world so that now the most rapid advancing places for the church in the world, South America, Asia, places that it never started. And so there is an adaptability to the gospel as this beautiful thing called the church moves out and moves forward. It's not about making carbon copies of itself. It's about allowing in that cultural expression the the lordship of Christ to be established. So that's why as we think about different generations and reaching out, being a next generation church, that's why we want to be good with saying we want you to prioritize Christ and express that in a way that is meaningful to you as your spiritual act of worship. And we'll do the same in our generation or the older generations or whatever. So it's really a beautiful adaptability to this new living in Christ that the gospel affords us. <clears throat> Thanks for being patient with my voice. I'm almost, I'm almost done, literally. Okay. <laughs> Ephesians 6. Uh, we're not only going to see new thinking and new living, but new challenges. Uh, Ephesians 6, 12 says, For our struggle is not against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the powers of this dark world, and against the spiritual forces in the heavenly realms. I would simply say this that as we face the new challenges, and there will always be challenges because the mission of Christ is not one that is unopposed. It has been opposed from the beginning, and it is opposed to this day. So as the church is unleashed, do not be surprised, church, when you begin to say, and, and, and let's just clarify for a second, when we're talking about the church being unleashed, we're not talking about the unveiling of a new program. We're not even always talking about the planting of a new church, although today we're celebrating that, certainly. We're not always talking about a mission trip, although that's another expression of the church being unleashed and and gifts being put in motion to serve. We're really talking about the simplicity of saying, God, here's my two hands. Use them as you will. When you begin to think that way as an individual, because there's a lot of corporate stuff here, but it has to come down to the personal level. To say, okay, God, how am I gifted to serve? How is my neighborhood able to be my mission field? How can I begin to pray for my neighbors? We're going to actually talk very specifically about that as the year unfolds and give you some opportunities. But I just want to make sure that I'm I'm helping you understand we're not talking about a big program. We're talking about the body of Christ just doing what it's called to do, forming relationships, exalting the the lordship of Christ and allowing that to unfold in your workplace, in your neighborhood, in your family, as God calls you to do it. When we do that, in this area of challenges, new challenges, we will find that there is a desperate need for prayer. I think that's one of the best parts about the opposition of the enemy is that it reminds us that we have a good God in whom we can rely, in, on whom we can lean, and who we must look to if we're going to see the mission of Christ fulfilled. So we see a desperate need for prayer. We see a new level of growth and ministry in this area because now it's not just about the logistics of doing church. We've got to understand the spiritual principles on which the church is built We've got to understand the, the spiritual principles on which the, the spiritual battles are won. When the church gets serious about that, we actually begin to mature and to grow in a new way. It actually calls us the new challenges, the spiritual opposition that we face will cause us to re-examine our priorities. 
okay? So when we say we're going we're gonna to see this advance for the kingdom of God, and then you face that opposition, and, and we've all been there, right? You know, you probably have been there if you've walked with Christ for a period of time, that you say, I want to see the, the kingdom of God expanded, and then you begin to face that opposition, when that opposition comes, maybe it's discouragement, maybe it's frustrated, maybe it's circum- frustration, maybe it's circumstantial, uh, maybe it's sickness, maybe whatever. When that opposition comes and the discouragement is there, it is really only then at that tested and tried point that you can say, do I really believe this? Do I really believe that the power of the gospel is what's going to change this world? Because if I don't really believe that, when the opposition comes, I will sort of go dormant. You know, I got, I got hard, I quit. When, when the opposition comes, it causes us to re-examine our priorities. Is it worth it to go after this even when it's hard, even when it's difficult, even when it's opposed? Because I guarantee you it will be. I guarantee you it will be. And if you say yes to saying church unleashed, you're going to see that the enemy says, okay, well, I'm going to stand against that. Because as one of our elders has told me many times, God does not attack dead people, or I'm sorry, the enemy does not attack dead people, and the enemy does not attack dead churches. But he does attack live ones. So we've got to be aware of that. New challenges. Our struggle is not against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against authorities, against the powers of this dark world, against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly realm. So put on the armor of God. It is in this area that we not only re-examine our priorities, but we see the church unleashed that takes new ground. The model will look different from one church to another, one gathering to another, but the church will endure. There will always be, even if it's a remnant, there will always be a group of people who say, Jesus Christ is the head of the church. I will be a part of it and I will follow him. And the model may look vastly different. I don't know what church is going to look like five years from now, let alone 50 years from now. But I do know, according to God's word, Jesus Christ said, I will build my church and the gates of hell will not stand against it. So if you want to be a church that's unleashed, Jesus is saying, okay, saddle up, let's go. Let's do it. I want to close with a quote from Bill Hybels. He asked a a thoughtful question. I've shared this, this quote in a few different settings. He says, will the local church, like State College Alliance, will the local church be sustained until the end of time? Now, before you answer too quickly, I remind you that whole empires made up of hundreds of millions of people that were thought to be permanent fixtures are curiously absent from the landscape today. Entire colossal world empires, gone. What about multi-billion dollar multinational corporations? Who would have thought that corporations with hundreds of millions of dollars of assets would just evaporate? And they have. So why should we have any confidence that this thing called the church can outlast empires and worldwide corporations? Well, Jesus said, I will build my church and the gates of hell will not prevail against it. What should give us all confidence that the church will outlast every other organization and dynasty and empire is who is building it, and who is regenerating it, and who is recreating it from generation to generation. Who is protecting it? And that is none other than Jesus himself, Savior and Sustainer of the church until the end of time. Let's close on that as we pray. Lord, we love this thing called the church, and it was your idea, and you've called us to be a part of it, and some of us are still kind of on that journey as I've been reflecting on the reality of the various commitments that you call us to, but all of the various commitments are essentially ones of surrender whether it's just first attending a church and say, I'm going to surrender some time to attend or I'm going to actually become a member of the church. I'm going to actually participate in the work of the church. I'm going to actually give myself and surrender my priorities for the work of the church. Lord, may it be said of us that we are a people that think differently. May it be said of us that we're a people that live differently. May we understand that when the opposition comes that we know where to run. And Lord, I would simply pray that you would do a great work of unleashing your church 
that Jesus' loving people would find opportunities to serve inside these walls and outside, that this community would, would know that we care about them and we love them because, Jesus, you've called us to love them. God, help us to be the church that you want us to be. Help us to dream big dreams. Help us to take risks where we need to take risks. And thank you, Jesus, that you are our cornerstone. Thank you that you are the unshakable rock on which we are building. We love you and we pray all this in your name. And all God's people said, amen.